If you've ever taken the Trans-Canada, Yellowhead, or Crow's Nest Highway through the Canadian Rockies, you may have gotten the impression of an unbroken series of mountain ranges, extending from British Columbia's interior plateau to Alberta's prairies and boreal forests. Geologists and geographers, however, make a distinction between the colder, harsher continental Rocky Mountains to the east, which run along the Alberta-BC border, and the drier and more ancient Columbia Mountains to the west, the latter lying entirely within the province of British Columbia. These two mega-ranges, each composed of multiple sub-ranges, are separated by what geologists call the Rocky Mountain Trench, a great valley which stretches from Montana's Flathead Lake to northern BC's Liard River. The dividing line between Canada's Columbia Range and the Continental Rockies consists of the artificial Kinbasket Reservoir and segments of three rivers, namely the Upper Fraser, the Upper Columbia, and the Kootenay. Geographic location is not the only characteristic which distinguishes these great conjoined mountain ranges. Unlike the world-renowned Rockies, whose resort towns like Banff, Jasper, and Lake Louise attract millions of tourists every year, Canada's Columbia Mountains are comparatively silent and desolate, home to sleepy mountain towns like Nelson, Revelstoke, and Kimberley. Instead of the crisp, clear mountain air, which drifts down from the snow-capped peaks of its eastern counterpart, the forests of the Columbia seem to be permeated by a thick, dreamy atmosphere, redolent of enchantment and ancient secrets, an unnerving aura which stimulates the primitive urge to look over one's shoulder. Mystery, rather than majesty, is the essence of this region. For centuries, the indigenous peoples of Canada's Columbia Mountains have maintained that they share their traditional territory with mountain-dwelling giants, who abide in the region's most desolate crags and canyons. The Lower Kootenay Indians, who lived along the shores of the Lower Kootenay River and Kootenay Lake, rarely venturing east onto the prairies for the annual buffalo hunt like their Upper Kootenay cousins to the east, believed that the giants who haunted their country were simple-minded creatures who could be killed through trickery. In his 1918 book, Kootenay Tales, German-American anthropologist Franz Boas included a traditional Kootenay story which told of a young hunter who transformed into a giant after eating some of his own flesh. When he started killing and eating his own friends and family, his fellow band members lured him to a cliffside trap overlooking Kootenay Lake and pushed him to his death in the water below. Throughout the 20th century, residents of the traditional territory of the Lower Kootenay Indians, which make up the eastern half of what is known today as the West Kootenays, have come forward with reports of huge hairy wild men, reminiscent of the legendary giants of regional legend. In both his 1975 book, The Search for Bigfoot, and his 2015 book, The Hunt for Bigfoot, Sasquatch researcher Peter Byrne claimed that he and his peers often collectively referred to the West Kootenays, the adjoining interior plateau, and northern Idaho as Area 2, these regions cumulatively having the second highest concentration of Bigfoot sightings in North America, after Area 1, the Pacific Northwest. Apparently unaware of the many wild man stories to come out of northern and eastern Canada, Byrne wrote, There are no records in the files of the Bigfoot Information Center, either from sightings, or from footprint findings or other evidence, of any credible Bigfoot activity outside of Areas 1 and 2. In his 1973 book, The Sasquatch File, Canadian journalist John Green listed an alleged encounter with one of the wild men of Area 2, which took place near the town of Invermere, a popular summer vacation destination on the northwestern shores of Windermere Lake, located on the western face of the Rocky Mountain Trench. According to René de Hinden, Green's friend and fellow Sasquatch researcher, who collected this regrettably vague report, an anonymous man saw a white or gray Sasquatch west of town sometime in the 1960s. West of Kootenay Territory, in the lonely lake country in the southwestern corner of the Columbia Mountains, is the historic domain of the Sinaixt, an interior Salish people, whom anthropologists once called the Lake Indians. Closely related to their westerly Okanagan cousins, the Sinaixt hunted alpine game in the Valhalla Mountains, 
and paddled their unique pine bark sturgeon nosed canoes up and down Slocan Lake and the upper and lower Arrow Lakes. Pressured by silver miners and Dukabor settlers, who took up residence in the area in the late 1800s, the Sinaiist gradually relocated to the Colville Valley in Washington and were officially declared an extinct First Nation by the Canadian government in 1956, a policy which was revoked in 2021. Although little formal academic work has been done on traditional Sinaiist culture, there is evidence that the Lake Indians' western kin firmly believed in the existence of Alpine giants. In her 1892 essay, Account of the Similkameen Indians of British Columbia, Scots-Canadian pioneer Susan Allison described some of the giant stories told to her by her Okanagan Indian friends, who hailed from the Similkameen River west of Okanagan Lake. There are numerous other stories that the old men are fond of relating while sitting round their campfires, she wrote. One in particular struck me. In the mountains, there live certain huge men. These men are so large that a deer, hung by its neck in their belts, looks no larger than a chicken would in a man's. The earth trembles as it echoes their tread. These giants, Allison's informants claimed, resembled white men with long beards. Although they were kindly disposed to humans, they sometimes captured lone hunters and carried them back to their caves, where they kept them as pets. Natives who managed to escape such captivity related that the giants were sensitive to pain and shed tears if they sustained the slightest injury. Despite their relative seclusion, the ancestral hunting grounds of the Sinaiaxt were the scene of several classic 20th century wild man sightings the subjects of which, it must be mentioned, bear little resemblance to the giants of Similkameen Okanagan legend. Among the most sensational of such reports was the experience of John Bringsley, a veteran woodsman from Nelson, British Columbia, who had hunted and fished in the West Kootenays for more than 35 years prior to the adventure in question. Over the years, several slightly different versions of Bringsley's story have appeared in print, not all of which agree on the date on which the experience took place. In his books, The Sasquatch File, Sasquatch the Apes Among Us, and On the Track of Sasquatch, Green dated the encounter to August 1960. Nearly all British Columbian newspaper articles which covered the story stated or implied that the encounter took place in September 1960, and Bringsley himself, during an interview with John Green and his fellow Sasquatch researcher Bob Titmus, erroneously declared that the event took place on August 7, 1962, nearly two years after his story first appeared in BC newspapers. Another detail on which sources butt heads is the location at which the sighting occurred. Although most publications which covered the story agreed that the incident took place near the headwaters of a stream called Lemon Creek, often misspelled with two M's, few were able to pinpoint this area geographically, most newspaper articles erroneously stating that the headwaters were located six miles east of Nelson. In fact, Lemon Creek has its origins in the Selkirk Mountains, about 16 miles northeast of Nelson, at the western edge of Kokanee Glacier Provincial Park, one of the oldest parks in the province. The creek flows west for about 12 miles, before emptying into the Slocan River, about 4 miles south of its head at Slocan Lake. According to an old local legend, occasionally referenced in newspaper articles, a group of miners headed up Lemon Creek at the turn of the 20th century and were never seen again. In his various statements to reporters and Sasquatch researchers, Bringsley made it clear that his sighting took place in the bush off an old logging road, which branched off Six Mile Road, the latter being a rugged mountain trail which veers off the BC Highway 3A about five miles northwest of Nelson, before winding north into the Selkirk Mountains, terminating about seven miles southwest of the headwaters of Lemon Creek. Taken together, Bringsley's various statements place his encounter in the vicinity of a small body of water, fittingly named Sasquatch Lake, which lies just south of Lemon Creek, about three and a half miles north of the terminus of Six Mile Road. Despite their spatial and temporal discrepancies, most sources which covered Bringsley's story generally agreed on the substance of the woodsman's encounter. On the weekend in question, at about 7.30 in the morning, Bringsley parked his 1931 coupe on a deserted logging road and headed into the bush with a bucket, intending to pick huckleberries. 
Bringsley found a promising berry patch about 100 to 200 yards from the road and went down on his knees to harvest. After about 15 minutes, Bringsley rose to his feet, having stripped that particular bush of its fruit. As he did so, his eyes came to rest on an enormous hairy animal standing about 40 to 50 feet away on a slight rise in the ground. At first, I thought it was a bear, the woodsman told Green and Titmus in their interview. But then I looked closer at it and realized it wasn't an animal. It was more like a human being. The creature, which Bringsley intuitively believed to be male, stood from seven to nine feet tall and had very wide shoulders. It had no neck, giving Bringsley the impression that its head was fastened directly to its shoulders. Its face was ape-like, and its ears lay flat against the sides of its head. It had human-like hands, complete with fingernails. Whether through mistranscription or Bringsley's own inconsistency, various sources provide two opposing descriptions of the relative length of the creature's arms and legs. An article in the October 4th, 1960 issue of Nelson's Daily News quoted Bringsley as saying that the wild man had long legs and short, powerful arms, a statement echoed in other contemporary newspaper articles. Conversely, an article in the February 1961 issue of the magazine Fate quoted the woodsman as saying that the creature had long arms and short, powerful legs. In his interview with Green and Titmus, Bringsley reiterated the enormity of the wild man's arms, comparing them to a man's thighs. Whatever the proportions of its limbs, the creature's entire body was covered with hair, which Bringsley estimated to be about four inches long and described as being smooth rather than shaggy. Unlike the dark or red-brown Sasquatch seen from time to time on the Pacific coast, this creature's coat was of a peculiar steel-gray color with a bluish tint. It looked terrible to me, Bringsley said, like a terrific human being. With a thrill of terror, Bringsley realized that the unusual creature was watching him with what he perceived to be an air of curiosity. Its head was cocked to the side, like it was trying to figure out what I was doing, the woodsman said. I wouldn't say it looked menacing at all, but it was sure curious to see what I was doing. Paralyzed with fear, Bringsley stood and stared at the creature, which initially seemed content to study its human visitor from afar. After about two minutes, however, the creature suddenly began to walk toward Bringsley, spurring the woodsman into action. Abandoning his huckleberry pail, the terrified woodsman made a dash for his vehicle, leapt into the driver's seat, and peeled down the logging road. Bringsley returned to the scene of his encounter the following day, armed with a rifle and accompanied by several friends. Although the giant made no appearance that day, the monster hunters managed to find one of its footprints, impressed in the forest floor. The track measured between 16 and 17 inches in length, and had what Bringsley described as a sharp toe print. At the time, wrote Green in his book, Sasquatch the Apes Among Us, I knew of no other reports from that southeastern corner of the province, which made his story hard to accept. Because my father had grown up at Caslow, my grandmother still lived there and they had never heard a rumor, or even a legend, of such a thing. Since that time, however, there have been more than a dozen additional reports from that vicinity. In the wake of Bringsley's encounter, the Nelson Chamber of Commerce, recognizing that a distinction ought to be made between the alleged wild men of the West Kootenays and its more famous counterparts in the Pacific Northwest and the Himalayas, proposed that the monster of Lemon Creek be given its own moniker. An article in the Calgary Herald helpfully proffered the nicknames Kootenir, the nasty nonsuch of Nelson, and, as a playful nod to the lone track discovered by Bringsley and company, the lone-legged legend of Lemon Creek. In the decades following Bringsley's encounter, other residents of the Slocan Valley, the Valhalla Range, and the Arrow Lakes region came to John Green and other Sasquatch researchers with their own wildman stories. In the Sasquatch file, Green described the experience of Dennis Merlot, an employee of the city of Trail, British Columbia, which lies on the Columbia River not far from the Montana border. Merlot told Green that in June 1970, he and one of his co-workers found large human-like tracks 
in a patch of dry mud on a hillside near Trail, fronting the Columbia River. These five-toed footprints had a length of 12 to 14 inches and a width of 6 inches. One year after Merlot's discovery, a similar find was made in New Denver, British Columbia, a village on the northeastern shores of Slocan Lake. Sometime in the summer of 1971, locals Robin Fluwin and Rick Dankowski came across mysterious human-like footprints on a road near Silverton Creek, a waterway which runs west through the Selkirk Mountains, paralleling Lemon Creek, before draining into Slocan Lake at New Denver. The tracks were two inches deep and were 17 inches long and six inches wide. About a year and a half later, another set of mysterious footprints were found near the city of Castlegar, British Columbia, which sits at the confluence of the Columbia and Kootenay Rivers, about 20 miles southwest of Nelson. On December 24, 1972, a local named Mrs. Gail Davidson phoned Green to tell him that her husband had found 16-inch-long human-like footprints on a trail on a hill behind their house. The tracks proceeded down the trail for about 150 yards, before veering into the bush. Two years later, Castlegar was the scene of another strange experience. This story was picked up by American Sasquatch researcher Peter Byrne, founder of the Bigfoot Information Center in the Dalles, Oregon, who heard it from the witnesses themselves. One night in 1974, a young American couple, who insisted on their anonymity, drove north of Castlegar, bound for the town of Silverton, just south of New Denver. As they came around a corner on the Castlegar-Silverton Highway, Byrne wrote, they saw a huge, dark brown or black hairy figure standing on the edge of the hardtop. Both occupants of the car saw it at the same time, and both were shocked at what they saw. They were adamant in their description that the creature was not a grizzly bear. They saw its arms, clearly, hanging by its side, and they saw its head, well-rounded and not at all bear-like. The creature stood perfectly still as they passed. They did not stop. They did not turn around and go back. Theirs was an eerie feeling, seeing that giant lonely creature standing solitary on that bleak roadside. They felt, with a gentle philosophy which we admired, that perhaps it was best left alone. North of traditional Sinaiic's territory, from the Columbia River north of Upper Arrow Lake, through Wells Gray Provincial Park, lies the homeland of the Shushwap, another interior Salish people, whose elders and storytellers spoke of mountain giants. Interestingly, according to the great Canadian geologist Dr. George Mercer Dawson, in his 1892 Notes on the Shushwap People of British Columbia, the Shushwap aver that unknown beings sometimes throw stones at them, particularly at night, when stones may be noticed occasionally falling into the fire. Mysterious nocturnal stone throwing is an activity which both Sasquatch researchers and the natives of the subarctic have attributed to the Canadian wildman. Like their southerly counterparts, the northern Columbia Mountains have produced several hair-raising wildman stories, many of which appear in classic Sasquatch books like John Green's. In November 1951, for example, a prospector from Kitchener, Ontario, told Rene de Hinden of a disturbing experience he had near the village of McBride, British Columbia, which lies on the western shores of the Fraser River, about 40 miles downriver from the ghost town of Tetjun Cache. After a day of panning and rock sampling, the anonymous informant and his prospecting partner returned to their lean-to to find that someone, or something, had slept in it during their absence. Before fleeing the scene, this mysterious alpine Goldilocks had also helped himself to a half-eaten mountain goat, which the prospectors had suspended from a tree. The only clue as to the identity of their late unpaying tenant lay in the fresh snow that surrounded their campsite namely barefoot, human-like footprints, measuring 15 to 16 inches in length. More than two decades later, another set of mysterious footprints were discovered in the northern frontier of traditional Shushwap territory. In the late autumn of 1970, 
an anonymous engineer employed by BC Hydro, British Columbia's main energy supplier, found large barefoot tracks in the snow near the northern end of Wells Gray Park, near the northern tip of the Columbia Mountains. He told a story to George Harris, a Sasquatch researcher from Nordeg, Alberta, who had investigated the Kootenay Plains Wildman sightings of 1969, who in turn relayed the information to Green. Discoveries of strange footprints and sightings of mysterious sylvan giants continue to be made in the Columbia Mountains from time to time by workmen, outdoor adventurers, and local residents, justifying the reputation of Peter Burns' area too. If you ever find yourself in this haunting stretch of British Columbia, keep your eyes peeled. If you're lucky, you might catch a glimpse of the region's elusive wildman, whom history has christened the Kootenir.